go. So the addition of multiple fixed effects for one predictor. That's the big picture concept. I've got several more specific instances in which this would occur, as we just discussed. When you have categorical variables with more than two categories, and when you're estimating nonlinear relationships of a quantitative predictor for a quantitative outcome. And if you want to test whether or not you can pretend an ordinal variable is interval. So all of those things come into play. The general idea is that any one predictor needs more than one fixed slope to fully describe its relationship with the outcome. So we are leaving the land of what you can do with the Pearson correlation and turning the corner. So linear models, um, this is the stuff we just reviewed. So empty model, add one predictor. Fixed effects in terms of uh, what you would get on your output. Each fixed effect, so either an intercept or a slope. So fixed effect is a more general term. Specific types are intercepts versus slopes. Each one is going to have an estimate for what the best guess is given your data for what it should be. The estimate that minimizes the variance of the ease across people. That's how it's found um, algebraically. Uh, it's going to have a standard error. So a standard error describes the expected inconsistency of that estimate across repeated samples of the same size. So it's inconsistency, meaning higher values is worse. Higher values means we have no idea what it's going to be. And with only a single slope in the model, how the standard error gets formed is a function of the model's residual variance, the variance of the predictor, because it's in units, and uh, the sample size. So you end up with an estimate that is in uh, units of y per units of x. Then you have a standard error that's in units of y per units of x. And when you divide by the two, the units cancel, and that gets you to your t test statistic. So um, I will probably start saying t value or t test instead of t test statistic. So I'm not like spitting all over my computer screen because that's a lot of t's to say. Uh, that's what's known as a wall test. So you'll see this either treated as a T or a Z across software programs. If it's a T, then we have to know denominator degrees of freedom, which is based on sample size minus the number of fixed effects that we had to spend to get to that level of prediction. And we have an unstandardized slope can be translated into a standardized slope um, by uh, taking the units back off. So we, you can get that as a piece of output in your software. And if you only have one predictor, then there's really no need to do that because it's the same as Pearson's correlation. That will change starting now, once we have more than one predictor. So just reviewing what it looks like to have a binary predictor. Any binary predictor, um, the easiest way to put it into the model is to make one of the groups the zero and one of the groups the one. It's up to you which is which. It honestly doesn't matter. It just changes where the reference is in terms of which group is being compared to the other. So for instance, if I have my grouping variable and I have my model that looks like this, then the group mean for the zero group would be given just by beta zero. The group mean for the one group is going to be a linear combination. So it's beta zero plus beta one is how we get to the, the one group's mean, which means that beta one tells us the sign difference. So if beta one is positive, then the one group is higher on its outcome than the zero group. If beta one is negative, the one group is lower than the zero group on its outcome. So sign matters because it tells you who's higher. And you can get any model predicted mean for any level of a predictor that's not the reference zero group as a linear combination using SAS estimate statements or state lincom statements. And by the way, this process, if you have a binary predictor of a quantitative outcome, is also known as a two-sample or independent groups t-test. Well, what if I have more than two groups? Can I do that? Sure I can. I can't do it with Pearson correlation, but I can do it with a, a model. So in general, if you have a categorical predictor with C categories, then you need C fixed effects to fully represent its effect its relationship to an outcome in a model. So that counts the intercept as one of them. So that's why if we only have two groups, that's C equals two, 
then we have a beta 0 and a beta 1, and we're good. If we have three groups, I need to pick up a second beta, a beta, another slope, I should say. So there's three total. So for instance, if I have three groups, then one of the groups is going to be the intercept, and I need beta 1 to distinguish group 1 from group 0, and I need beta 2 to st distinguish the other group from the 0. If I have 4, which you'll get a chance to practice on your homework, then I need three slopes. Uh, what if I had five groups? How many slopes would I need? Yeah, four. If I had six groups? Five? Yes, you got it. Uh, here's a formula, by the way, uh, that you can use to calculate the number of group means and group mean differences. So if I have three groups, there's three possible the term is pairwise differences. That means for each unique combination of the two. So if I have three groups, then I have group one versus two, one versus three, and two versus three. If I have four groups, I've got one versus two, one versus three, one versus four, two versus three, two versus four, and three versus four. And so there's six. So the number of possible group comparisons that you would be interested in potentially to get each combination of the two to be discussed. This formula gives you that. But the cool thing about this is that even though there's so many different group comparisons, they all show up with just as many fixed effects as you have groups. So even though, say, for four groups, there's six possible mean differences I might be interested in, I only need four parameters to get them because those four, as linear combinations, give me all possible differences. So that process of how you get the model to tell you directly what you want and how to ask for what the model also tells you indirectly as linear combinations, that's what we're going to practice. And by the way, this idea of extending a predictor to include more than two groups is analysis of variance. So historically, Analysis of variance is taught differently and separately from multiple regression. That is not going to be the case in this class because they are based on the same model. So how many of you have seen ANOVA type stuff before? Okay, half of you maybe. Okay, well you get to see it again and hopefully get to see it in a different way that lends itself a little more easily to adding on greater complexity. So here's an example. In the same um, general social survey data set, there is an item that asks people to rate themselves as to whether they felt they were lower class, middle class, or upper class. Undoubtedly, this is going to be related to income level, but it makes a nice example. So within our 734 people in the data set I've been playing with, uh, most of them said that they were lower class, a good chunk said they were middle class and very few people said they were upper class. So the trick to being able to put this three category predictor into the model is to create multiple binary versions of the variable that fully distinguish all three categories. So this is the process of what's known as dummy coding or contrast coding where you have to decide which group you want to be as the reference. So in this case, I've chosen the low group. So I need to create two new predictor variables to fully distinguish the three categories of this possible grouping variable. So these are new columns that would be created in the data set. In order to make the low group the reference, I have to give the new variables for it zeros because the intercept is the expected outcome when all the predictors are zero. What I'm telling it is then make the intercept the, the low group. So the low group is going to be, have its mean directly represented by the intercept in this coding scheme. Okay, with me so far. Then the next group, middle. I want the first new predictor to distinguish the middle group from the low group. So I give the middle group a one to sort of activate it, like this is gonna be my comparison group. I don't wanna talk about the upper group yet, so I'm gonna give them a zero. Then I need a second variable 
to distinguish the two cases that currently have a zero. So I give the upper group a one in the second variable. And so when both of these variables are put together in the same model as predictors, they have the interpretation that's given in the title here. The first variable, its beta, is going to be the difference of how the group coded one differs from zero. So this will be how middle differs from lower. The second variable then becomes the difference of how upper differs from lower. So lower as the reference, I have middle versus lower and I have upper versus lower. That means that the missing contrast for middle versus upper is going to be a linear combination of those two. So I have SAS and Stata code then for how this works. So this looks similar to what we did uh, last class, actually, in recoding a binary variable, just with another variable thrown in because I have three groups instead of two. So first step is to generate blank columns that are going to hold these zeros and ones. So I have named them L versus M, which to me means lower versus middle, and L versus U, which is lower versus upper. You would name these however makes sense to you to describe what that variable is supposed to be capturing. So I would highly encourage you to come up with some kind of system of naming things that make sense to you. So like if it's numbered groups, you might have G1 versus G2 or something like that. So I'm generating these blank new variables here in SAS and in Stata. And then I am systematically, conditionally recoding them into zeros and ones based on the three category grouping variable that I have. So the name of this variable in the data set is work class. So I'm saying if work class equals one, then do the following. So in SAS, anytime that you want to execute more than one command as a result of meeting some equality, you need a do and then you need an end that shuts off the do. So it's like a little wrapper around it that says if da 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 done. So if work class equals one, then I want the first variable to take a zero, I want the second variable to take a zero, and then I'm done. The same thing happens in Stata in the first two lines here. To the best of what I've been able to tell, Stata's ifs do not allow you to have multiple um, condition or do multiple things at the same time. The code to do it was more, uh, more problem than it was worth. So I have two of these. So it's if work class e equals equals one, meaning if it meets this condition, then replace L versus M equals zero. So both of these are doing the same thing, just with a switch in the order. So work class is the original three category column with the values one, two, three, the new variables that are being created are the zero one variables L versus M and L versus U. So then if it's group two, the first predictor turns on, so to speak, takes a one, the second predictor stays off, and then if it's group equals three, the second predictor turns on. So we have these two variables that now work together to distinguish the three groups. By the unique combination of the zero and the one across the two, all three groups are identified. Okay, how are we doing? Am I talking too fast? Oh, do, we, do you guys want the words on? I forgot that part. Okay, there. Now we'll see if I'm talking about fish sticks or whatever today. Okay, there, I gotta put the phone in the way. All right, so questions on this coding scheme yet? There are like 8,000 ways to code variables. This is probably the easiest to do and the most common. So we're starting there, but I'll show you a few other variants in this unit as well. Can you only do this with three or can you keep going with more predictors? Great question. So if I had a fourth group, right? I don't know, super rich or something, the 1%, whatever would be above upper class. What would I have to do to change it to make that work? Would you need like a totally new 
Well, I'm just thinking like the number combinations over to the right of that little chart would have to change so you'd have alternative like what you would see would be different but I don't I don't know if it makes a difference since you're just using like two sets of like zeros and ones right now I don't know if you need to add like a two into it uh, you would need to add a third set okay a third column mm -hmm. okay yep so then you would have a third column out here that would be L versus the one percent and then it would be zero 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 one and then that they would be zeroed out here. So it would look like a diagonal. Like if in the code here, you'd add a third one, it'd be like one, one, one on the diagonal. And that's related to the idea on the previous slide here. If I have three groups, I need an intercept and two slopes. So the new columns that I'm creating are what I'm gonna give the slopes to. If I have four groups, I need an intercept and three slopes. So this, let me see it go back here. There we go. So this two column structure only works if I have three groups. If I had four groups, I need three of them. Where each group that's not the reference would be one at some point. So the second group gets their turn in the first column, the third group gets their turn, and then the fourth group would get their turn in the column that's not here. So good questions. Other questions? I've also seen in, in some projects that I've worked on, they just combine the groups into three. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. So, so looking at socioeconomic status was one where they combined low and then medium low with medium and then medium high with high. Um, I think that was because there was low numbers in each group, but um, wondering if that if that's the best way to do that or if looking at five comparisons would be better? I think it's an empirical question because if you are squishing groups together, what you are saying is that they have the same mean. And the extent to which that is not the case is testable by having all five groups. Um, you may not have enough power to detect the differences. And so, yeah, if I only have two people in this group and three people in that group, I may as well combine them because functionally I can't distinguish between them. Um, actually, in this data set, I think the original version of this variable had like five categories, and I made it three to make an example out of. And in part, that was because of the differences in sample size. So I can tell you right now, without doing any analyses, that having only 20 people in this group is going to limit the power to distinguish the upper group from each of the other two. So they may make a choice to lump things together because there's not enough people, um, but I would probably recommend to the greatest extent possible testing that assumption before lump doing the lumping. Like if you did the, the five category model and three of them were basically the same, you know, and you want to lump them in to go further, then at least you have some supporting data to suggest that you're not missing anything. Other questions? So then what goes into the model are these two new columns that we created, not the original three category variable. So the model looks like this then. I have beta zero as my fixed intercept. I have beta one as the slope that is gonna be applied to this first column. And then I have beta two as the slope for the second column. So Fayaz, question? Um, so which part of it is the dummy coding? Is it the you know setting of the zeros for the the you know the first one, or is it the whole process of dummy coding? The the coding scheme in which each group is a one at some point, and zeros otherwise is dummy coding. Okay. Um, you will also reference group is always zero. Yes. Yeah. And so that is entirely based on how you set up the coding. So. In this case, I am choosing to make the low group the reference by giving them zeros in both places. If I wanted to make the upper group the reference, I would give them zeros in both places instead, and then the low group would have to pick up a one in one of these categories. And this whole process is done coding, right? Yes, yes. Um, contrast coding is, an, is a term for that. 
There's another one that is called effects coding, and that's when you give one group a minus one and another group a one. That one is sometimes useful, but often weird because then nobody's the zero. So then your intercept refers to a person who doesn't exist, which is not a good reference point. You know, fictitious people, not a good strategy oftentimes, but there are certain situations in which that can be advantageous. So yes, this, this process of making two new predictors to represent the three groups is dummy coding, as I've described it here. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So when you code something like this in this format, like using dummy coding, doesn't it mess up the coefficient system and the interpretation of it? It does if you leave one of the dummy codes out. Okay. So like if I did not put in this second variable right here, then this first column does not give me low versus middle. What does it give me instead if this first column is all by itself? Low and upper versus middle. Exactly. It mushes together low and upper because they're both zeros. Because this one variable doesn't understand that those are two different things. That's why we need the second variable, which then separates those two mush together categories into zero versus one. So yeah, you do have to be careful that they all work together as a set to fully delineate the means. Otherwise you can end up with some messed up results. Is that what you were thinking, Fayaz, or were you going down a different path? So um, in, in one of my models, I had like eight covariates where, you know, R did the dummy coding for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what it once happened like this, that I forgot to include one of the variables into, into the equation and the coefficients that I got were totally off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the interpretation of what one means is predicated on having all of these things together. By the way, I am deliberately not showing this class that R did it for me. <laughs> um, Stata will do it for you. SAS will do it for you. Every program will do it for you, except for M plus that I know of. I am deliberately hiding that from you because I want you to see how it works and to be able to control it. And then you can let the program do some of it for you with, with the, the interpretations already locked into your head as to what's going on. But otherwise, if it does it good. for you, you don't know what it's doing, right? No, this is actually good because I, I did this, but I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> and, you know? Yeah. Yep, it's, it's dangerous when someone else does it for you and you never have to do it yourself, right? Yeah, th this is why, you know, I stopped zipping up my son's jacket, right? It's time that he needs to do it for himself. Like, zippers are not magic. If, in doing it for yourself, I think you'll appreciate better what's happening when the program does it for you because it does change the interpretations of things. Each program has a different set of defaults as to who it makes the reference group. So, for instance, if you let the program do it in R, first group's the reference. Stata, first group's the reference. SAS, last group. SPSS, last group. So you have to like know all of these things to be able to make sense of what follows. If you set it up yourself, you automatically know what it means because you coded it in a way that meant it that way. So you have the power. So great questions. Other questions? So why hat then versus why? What's the difference in terms of notation? I've got actual versus predicted. What am I saying here? What's not in the second line that's in the first? The residual. Yeah. So the second line is saying, what does the model predict for each person? It's the Y hat that's given by the model, which is based entirely on which group you're in. Then E is becomes what's left. So the full model for Y is what does the model say? And then how far off is the model that gets you back to Y. So Y hat then is going to be important in some of the formulas that follow so I want to make sure that you understand what that's saying. It's the why the model thinks you have. 
So anybody who's in the same group has the same predicted y. All people in the lower group have the same predicted mean, all people in the middle group have the same mean, and all people in the upper group have the same mean. So how does the model then create the mean for each group? Well, for the lower group, it's based on the equation and filling in the values for the predictors that correspond to how you set up the coding scheme. So everybody has the same three fixed effects in creating their predicted outcome. Beta zero, beta one, multiplied by the value of the variable that beta one is the slope for. So if I'm talking about the low group, that's when both of my new predictor variables are coded zero. So that means the last two terms cancel and the model tells me that the mean for the low group is just beta zero. So the intercept is the y that is predicted for the low group. It is the y group, the low group's mean. The other two are linear combinations. So the model output is not gonna tell you directly what the mean for the upper group is or the mean for the middle group. You have to ask for those two, and I'll show you how because it's found as a linear combination. So the mean for the middle group starts with beta zero, and then it picks up beta one for how far off the middle group is from low. So beta one is a difference. Because we're talking about middle, beta two drops because that is coded zero for the middle group. And so the result is that the middle group mean is found as the fixed intercept beta zero plus the slope for beta one. Same pattern happens for the upper group where the second term drops instead and the upper group mean is given by beta zero plus beta two. So this is what I mean by linear combination. It is multiple estimated fixed effects added together that create the model implied means for these groups. So even though the low group is the only group whose mean is given directly by the model, the model still indirectly gives us the means for the other groups too. In terms of the differences, how many possible differences are there amongst my three groups? Not a trick question, I swear. How many possible differences among my three groups? Pairwise differences. Yeah, three. <laughs> there's, one ver there's low versus middle, low versus upper, and middle versus upper. All three of those differences are in here too. If the model can get me all three means, it can get me all three mean differences. I just have to know how to ask for them and where to find them. The good news is that two are already given to me. So if I take these model implied means here and I start with what it is for the alternative group. So the middle group, for instance, is beta zero plus beta one. The mean for the low group which is what I want it relative to, is just beta zero. The beta zeros cancel, and I'm left with beta one. Likewise, if I'm talking about the upper group, that beta two is all that's left. So this is just saying that the difference of how the middle group differs from low and how the upper group differs from low is given directly as these model parameters. That is what beta one and beta two mean. And the only reason they mean it that way is because of the system of zeros and ones that I've set up here. I control the meaning of the slopes. So beta one is mid middle versus low, excuse me, low versus middle, meaning low is the reference, how far off middle is. Beta two tells me upper versus low. There's one more, and that one is a linear combination. So the same logic, the model tells me what the mean is for the upper group as beta zero plus beta two. I want to know how that mean for the upper group differs for the mean from the middle group, which is beta zero plus beta one. The beta zeros cancel, and I'm left with beta two minus beta one, as how the model tells me indirectly, as a linear combination, how the non-reference groups differ from each other. So more generally, in this type of dummy coding scheme, the model is going to directly give you everything you want to know about the reference group. The intercept will be its mean, 
and each of the model slopes will tell you how the other groups differ from reference. So the model covers reference. Anything that's not reference is a linear combination. So you can find the means for the other two groups and the mean differences between the other two groups as linear combinations using estimate statements in SAS or LinCom statements in Stata. And not in SPSS. It doesn't have the statements. Okay, how are we doing? Okay so far? Yeah, a, little, a little shaky. That's, it's to be expected. It's your, it's your first time with, you know, this many betas on one screen. Uh, how about some numbers? Numbers usually make it a little better. And then I'll show you, uh, maybe this time we'll see how far we get. So how do we tell the software then to do all these things for us? First in SAS and then in Stata. So with three groups, that means I need three means, one for each group, and then I need three mean differences. So I've just repeated these uh, ways of saying how the model tells you what the mean is for each group plus what the difference is. And these three lines here, these three equations, correspond to this, the three sets of uh, these estimate statements, two sets of three. So this is what it would look like to do this model in SAS. So income is the outcome variable, and L versus M and L versus U are my predictors. So that is the zero versus one coding scheme that I've completed ahead of time. So you would need to make the predictors first, then include them in the model. And then these estimate statements in SAS, it insists that you give a title to it. So this is very helpful to leave yourself a trail of breadcrumbs as to what you're trying to estimate. And it also prints the label in a table, which is something that you can easily port into a manuscript or send to somebody else. So the words in these estimate statements refer to the betas. That's the trick to understanding these. They do not refer to the variables, they refer to the betas. So when I write intercept one, I am referring to this top equation right here that gives me the low mean and saying, I need one beta zero, please. Think of this as like the person at the drive-through making an order. It's like, yeah, I'd like one beta zero and that's all. Cause everything else is zeroed out. They're like, would you like fries with that? No, thank you. Would you like to try our new Jamocha shake? No, thank you. Okay, drive through, pay at the second window. So I need one beta zero. I do not need a beta one, and I do not need a beta two. So that's why there are zeros after these because the, the values refer to the multipliers in parentheses. And why those variables values are zero is because that's how I set it up. Because I created these variables to have a value of zero if I'm talking about the low group, that corresponds to the values of zero right here, which correspond to the multipliers. So L versus M is beta one. L versus U is beta two. Then the second car at the drive through yeah, I need one beta zero and I need one beta one. And the third car, I need one beta zero and I need one beta two. So anytime that you want to create a model predicted outcome, I've labeled this low mean, mid mean, up mean, but I could also label this as Y hat. Y hat for the low group, Y hat for the middle group, Y hat for the upper group. Anytime you're trying to create a model predicted outcome like that, all of the fixed effects have to be considered. If you leave them out, then you are giving them values of zero. So technically speaking, I did not have to write the terms that have multiplied by zero, but I'm doing it to keep all of the lines in parallel. Okay, so the first three lines get me my model predicted means. The only one that I, that I didn't have to write is the low mean one here, because that is already given by the intercept, but it can be helpful to have them all in the same place. Okay, questions on that? So then the last three lines. Notice what's not there. 
where my giant pink mouse is. What's not there? The intercept. The intercept, yes. Because what I am asking for are slopes. I am asking for differences. And the intercept always cancels out of any difference. So when you're writing these statements in your homework four, like a month from now, if you're asking for differences, the intercept does not go there. And so that is shown in the second set of equations up here, how the model gives me the mean for the middle group minus how the model gives me the mean for the low group is directly just beta one. So this line right here, low versus mid, where the only term that is activated, so to speak, that just means I need one beta one. Beta one is low versus middle. That's what it means. Likewise, low versus upper is just beta two. So the only line that I really needed to write here that's not redundant with what's already in the model in terms of differences is the last one. The last one tells me how the non-reference groups differ from each other. So I have beta zero plus beta two is how the model tells me the upper group. Beta zero plus beta one is how the model tells me the middle group. The beta zeros drop and I'm left with beta two minus beta one. And then I'm writing it in the same order down here. That's why beta one is first and it's the minus one because it's minus beta one and plus beta two. I have a visual that goes with this that may help if this is looking strange. So out of these six lines, what the model is already gonna give you without you having to ask for it separately are any of the lines that are not linear combinations. So the first line with the low mean, not a linear combination, all that's here is beta zero. Low versus mid, not a linear combination. Low versus upper, not a linear combination. So it's the lines that refer to not the reference group, known as the alternative groups. Those are the ones you have to write to get their means and to get their mean difference. The state of code to do this is exactly the same, but it is more explicit in following the equation that motivates these terms. So here's what it would look like in Stata. I have C dot in front of my new predictor variables because in order to use them in math in the Lincom statements, you have to put that on there. So Stata is treating these as quantitative variables, which is fine. So I have regress income. So the first word after regress is always the outcome to be predicted, followed by the predictor variables in the model, followed by a comma to separate off any options for what I'm asking about. So then the first three statements here, underscore cons, that's Stata's version of the intercept. And so I need one beta zero, I need zero beta ones, and I need zero beta twos to get me to the low group mean. And then for the group differences down here, I need only one beta one to get me low versus mid, only one beta two to get me to low versus upper, and I need beta one minus one plus beta two times one to get me to mid versus upper. So that right here. Okay. How's that so far? I have a question um, about the SAS code. Um, can you just go explain again why the negative goes with the L versus M instead of the L versus U? Because the order of these things um, it's which one do you want to call like the reference of the comparison because then the sign matters for that. So up mm -hmm. here, the way I've organized it is that it's the second one minus the first one that creates the first one as the reference. And so because it's beta two minus beta one, beta one is right here. So I could have written this as minus beta one plus beta two. So the negative oh. sign right here translates to this negative sign right there. Okay. So it means subtraction. Okay, yeah, okay. 
So anytime you have positive numbers, it's a linear combination where you're adding the terms together and it works out to be subtraction if one of the terms is negative. Okay. And the same is true for Stata. That negative one corresponds to the minus sign in front of beta one right here. Okay, other questions? Okay, now I have numbers. I knew that was coming. So if I have an empty model for this outcome, we did this in the last example, but I've repeated it here just for the sake of the comparison. If I have no predictors in the model, beta zero is 17, because that is the mean of this variable, and it has a standard error of 0.51, and the residual variance is 190. So 190, all the variability and in income that there is to be had. Now the model that I just told you about, where we've included two new slopes that distinguish the middle group from the low group and the upper group from the low group, then the results that go with this, so the beta zero is estimated at 13.67, and because of my coding scheme, beta zero is always the expected outcome when all the predictors are zero. That's my fixed intercept. When all the predictors are zero, is when you're in the low group. So beta zero is the predicted outcome, the mean of that outcome in the low group specifically. Beta one and beta two are slopes. They are the change in y for a one unit change in x. A one unit change in x corresponds to switching to the group coded one. So beta one, the slope is estimated at 8.8, .8. That is telling me that the group coded one for that variable, the middle group in this case, is higher than the low group by 8.85. So I'm trying to, to phrase it, the low versus mid implies low is the reference and the coefficient tells me how mid is relative to that reference. If I had it the other way around, the slope would be the same number, but negative. So if the slope is positive, the group coded one is higher on Y. If the slope is negative, the group coded one is lower on Y. Same thing with beta two. That estimate is 10. So beta two is the effect of L versus U. So the effect of being in the upper group relative to the low group. And the upper group makes about $11,000 more on average. And both of those slopes are significant according to the model. And the residual variance is down to 190. So putting in this three category predictor reduced the information in income from 190 down to 171. So foreshadowing, was it beta one that reduced it, beta two or both? It's not as obvious now. They're both significant, which suggests they both matter, but we have to have a different way of answering that question than just looking at each of the coefficients because they work together to fully distinguish all three groups. And so what we don't know yet then are the linear combinations. If I take beta zero and add to it beta one, that gets me to the mean for the middle group. Beta zero plus beta two gets me to the mean for the upper group. And then the difference in those two numbers, beta two minus beta one was estimated as 2.13, which was not significant. So that the upper group and the middle group are not significantly different in income. But low is lower than both. And this is the picture. Yeah, I knew I had a picture in here. I just made it. And if you look at this and go, what? This may help. So I've repeated the fixed effects up here and I've color coded them to help this make it easier. I've repeated the variables that the fixed effects refer to. And I have in a spreadsheet calculated how the model predicts each of these means. So these came from the previous page as well. 
So if I try to put this into a rise over run kind of terminology in terms of how to interpret these slopes, the x-axis here, I've got two different axes. One is distinguishing lower and middle, and the other, the second one, is distinguishing lower and upper. So beta 0, then, is the mean for the lower group. That's the 13.65. The change in y for a one unit change in x, that's the red triangle. So as we move over x by one, y goes up by 8.8 .8 to get me to the predicted mean for the middle group of 22. On the second x-axis, as I go from a zero to a one on x, y goes up by 10.98. And then if I want to know whether these two latter groups are different, that's just the difference between where their triangles hit right here. That's where the 2.1 comes in. So there are six possible numbers that you might want to know out of this analysis. Three group means, three group mean differences. You only need to know three of the six numbers to find the other three. If you know one of the means and two of the mean differences, which are the three parameters that come directly out of the model, you can get to the other three, the other two implied means and the third implied difference, if you know how to ask the software for it. Okay, questions. Any of that you want to hear again or hear differently? Maybe you answered this already, but, and I'm just still trying to wrap my head around it, um, but the, it matters which of those three six numbers you know though, right? It's not like just any three of the six, like it's dependent upon which ones you know as to whether or not you can get the other three. Mm -mm, I just need three. Just three, mm -hmm. okay. The others are all linear combinations. Okay, that you just can plug in. Mm -hmm. So okay. as an alternative coding scheme, for instance, what if I got rid of the intercept? I know that sounds crazy, but you actually could do that. Let me go back to, yeah. If I got rid of the intercept, then I could do a coding scheme where instead of an intercept and two predictors, Going back here, what if I just added a third column where it was a one for the low group? And I put in those three variables. Then what I would end up with is the mean for each group directly as a model parameter. And if I know the means for each group, I know their mean differences. Because I can do a subtraction to find them. So I just need three. And which three you want, up to you. So this is one coding scheme. It's the most common, but it's not the most universal. I mean, there's others, I should say. It's not always universal. And the rationale for learning how to write these kinds of statements right here, these estimate statements in SAS, or the LINCOM statements in STATA, like if I just look at the picture here, I can do the math, right? I can take, you know, the mean of 24 minus 22 and find out that the mean is two. But the math for the standard errors is something that is less easy to do. There are formulas for it, but it's kind of a pain in the ass. So the, the rationale for learning how to ask for the other three parameters that are found as linear combinations is that not only do you get their estimates, but you get their standard errors. And if you get their standard errors, then you can do a hypothesis test. So then, for instance, in this context, the missing difference is something that these values came out of the results of that estimate statement or that LINCOM statement. And this is something that I never learned how to do when I was taking these classes as an undergraduate and even in graduate school. So I'm hoping that by introducing this from the get-go that I can save you some heartache. Because otherwise, how would you get this additional difference? 
Like if you wanted to know if group one and group two differed from each other, how would you go about doing that? And you didn't know how to do linear combinations. Well, how I learned how to solve that problem is to change the reference group, right? Come up with a new coding scheme where either of these is a reference group, rerun the model, and then now one of the slopes is going to tell me this one. But what if you have like eight groups? That gets painful. So learning how to get everything that the model tells you, both directly and indirectly, will save you some time. That's my hope. Okay, other questions before we adjourn for the day? For the week, actually, it's not garbage day, which means I say, have a good weekend instead of I'll see you Thursday. Uh, office hours at 3.15 if anybody wants me. Otherwise, uh, take care and I'll see you next week. So, have a good one.